Welcome everybody uh, to this union symposium on the role and impact of fire in the earth system across spatial and temporal scales. I will do first an introduction um, of uh, yeah, some minutes and then we will have uh, five speakers uh, from all around the world um, that will present us their perspective on this topic. And then in the end, we will have also time for a discussion, asking questions to all of the speakers, but also your questions. So if you have topic specific, so to individual speaker specific questions, please post them to the question and answer box that you find on the bottom of your room screen. And in the, if you have some more general questions, we will uh, pick them up from the question and answer box and we can uh, post them later on them. So for now, um, the question is, why are we running this session? And I think um, many of you know uh, from the media that, uh, uh, or from your own research that fire is an important uh, factor in the earth system and that we are experiencing in the recent years more fires, more intense fires as also reflected in the media. And um, even now, uh, today, we are experiencing fires in many regions across the globe, as you see on the, on the map. And the questions are, uh, what is driving these fires? What is causing? What and who is causing these fires? And uh, also, how special are these fires now? Are they related to climate change and so on? But if we are talking about uh, future forest management, forest fire management or grassland management, we are also interested in the impact of fire on the different uh, parts of the earth system. And that's why um, it's also uh, good to know um, if, there, if fires are always bad or if it could be also have a, a, a good function, let's say an ecological function and how all the, the feedbacks and processes are working uh, with fire and in the earth system. And uh, we are discussing this at the EGU General Assemblies uh, during the last years in several questions across many divisions of the EGU. And there um, uh, we met, we conveners met each other and we are coming from very different backgrounds because fire is a topic that has not its own discipline, but it's researched uh, in many different disciplines and with many different perspectives. And so we thought it would be great uh, to have a symposium like that, where we could invite uh, some experts uh, that are also having these very different um, perspectives on, on fire, on landscape burning. And we will first have two speakers uh, from Australia, um, that are presenting uh, a more broad scale uh, perspective. So David Bowman will start with that. And then we'll, uh, Faye Johnson will take over and uh, report on the impact of uh, burning and smoke on human health. And then I will hand over the moderation to Peter Laslop and she will introduce to you Guido van der Werf, uh, Christina Santin and Orsi Volko. Um, and uh, then we will have uh, a discussion on um, with all of them that is moderated by Katlina Stowe. We are starting now uh, with uh, David uh, Bowman. I just, uh, a few words to yourself uh, because uh, you are a pyrogeographer. Uh, That's uh, really nice that you are establishing uh, pyrogeography as a discipline. You are a, uh, the uh, director of the Fire Center in uh, Tasmania and you're also a fellow of many different universities across the world. And it, you are really, uh, for me, one of uh, the persons really influencing uh, my fire research as well, because you're uh, providing a very uh, transdisciplinary understanding of fire across uh, temporal scales, time scales, but also on spatial scales. So now I hand over to you. Hi, hopefully you can hear me now. Um, so yeah, what I want to talk about is um, uh, basically, really my lived experience. Um, and that is that um, at the end of this talk, I, I'm hopefully will be able to convince you that there really is a global fire crisis and there is a need to be thinking about how we're gonna get out of this problem by not just continuing to walk down the same groove. We actually have to have um, adaptive thinking. And I want to, uh, think out loud about what adaptive thinking uh, looks like and what some of the principles might be uh, for 
for fire science and and particularly how uh, synthetic thinking like pyrogeography could become more prominent. So the global fire crisis, um, this is some work that I'm doing with Crystal Colden uh, and the reinsurer Munich Re, and we're seeing um, a steady but uneven increase in fatalities, fire events, economic costs, numbers of disasters. And uh, some work we did a few years ago where we looked at truly extreme energetic fires and the disastrous fires, uh, the top 500 energetic events and those which were disastrous, we saw a concerning uh, feature and that is that the little uh, triangles, uh, the red triangles are, are also concentrated in areas which are notorious for fire, but they're also projected to be uh, going to experience worsening fire weather. So, you know, we really have the makings for an ongoing and escalating global fire crisis. And so that leads us to what we're now calling the Black Summer fires, the, the fires we've just been through, uh, really a truly extreme fire season and for, for Considering that since the, the Black Saturday fires, 2009, and then here in Tasmania, uh, the fire which saw the first pyrocumulo nimbus, the fire thunderstorm which destroyed a village, 2013, the wilderness fires of 2016, and then another burst of wilderness fires in 2019. Uh, last year, we had basically a continual uh, a continual fire crisis actually went from Tasmania uh, back to northern New South Wales and worked itself back down to Tasmania again. One of the things that I'd like to point out about this summer's fires is that there's something really peculiar about them and that is their, where they fit geographically and the top two plots uh, on the left hand side we're seeing the density of where fires are in a climate space of temperature and mean annual precipitation. And we're seeing where the temperate forests, the green are. And that basically these fires were concentrated in forests. And another way of looking at in geographical space, you can see the fires were concentrated in some of the most productive environments in Tasmania, the forests on the East Coast, Tasmania, uh, uh, Australia, uh, the east coast of Australia. Uh, Australia is a very arid continent. These are the most productive environments. And I think right at the, the outset, we need to be clear about something, that these ecological systems, eucalyptus forests, have a very, very ancient pedigree and adaptation to fire. So it's not that these fires were unusual in the sense of their occurrence. These are a fire adapted system that the, the phylo, phylogenetic analysis we did of the epicormic buds, this unusual capacity of eucalypts to bounce back from rebuilding their canopies. The evidence is that goes back for at least 60 million years in the eucalyptus clade. So what makes us think that this black summer fire event was really unusual. Let's think of some of the causes and the consequences. And the cause is actually fairly simple. It was just extraordinarily dry. The gray and, and dark gray bands are standard deviations and that's an index of fuel dryness. Basically, the place was, uh, you know, really crackling dry, waiting for ignitions that there was no rain and so if there were ignitions there were going to be basically gigantic fires and that's precisely what happened. The ignitions, some were lightning, some were anthropogenic. But basically once the, the fuel was lit, there was basically an unbounded opportunity for something between five to more than 10 million hectares of forest burnt in one fire season, which is just, uh, you know, just a mind bending amount of burning over about a five month period. Now, what was also concerning about these fires is that uh, 
the paracumulonimbus, nimbus, the paracebesis, we call them, really classically were a black swan event. Uh, they're very rare, but in this fire season, we had something like 35 pyrocumulonimbus, which is pretty well, you know, doubling or if not an enormous contribution to the known pyrocumulonimbus fire events in Australia. That, you know, there was just a, um, an extraordinary number of these events. This is a, a, a view from the International Space Station, these events punching up into the stratosphere. And one of the most extraordinary things about that was that the smoke then did a complete lap and a bit more around the Southern Hemisphere. Smoke alarms went off in Auckland, uh, deposits of ash on glaciers in New Zealand and in, in, in South America. The smoke went right around and came back to Australia, which is just a, an astonishing thought that the quantities of smoke which were emitted. And that smoke uh, exposed most of the Australian population, certainly the city-based population, to episodic um, and dangerous levels of smoke. So, you know, you would have seen the photographs of Sydney, Melbourne, Brisbane, Canberra, sometimes the worst air quality in the world uh, was being recorded in these cities, exposing the Australian population to, to, this, uh, to this hazard. So there, there's some of the things which I think we can be very clear about, but the politics of this became very complicated, particularly in real time, because we were asked to provide commentaries. You know, were, was this unusual? Was it within historical variability? What was the role of climate change? Was it the effect of fuel management? Was it the effect of forest legacies, cessation of Aboriginal burning? arsonists, how many animals were killed, you know, was Australia, were, were the bushfires basically a major greenhouse gas emitter? These were all very real live political issues. The problem was that actually we don't know. That's the problem. The problem is that the uh, hosing down those political debates in real time was impossible and subsequently it's still very difficult. And I would argue that you can't have bushfire adaptation without evidence-based policy. That's absolutely critical that we need that, but to have that, you've got to have good evidence. And here's just an illustration of the problem that there are all these numbers out there of how large the fires were. To know how large the fires were, you need to know their geographical domain, you need to know uh, when they, when the fire season began and ended, you need to have some reliable method of uh, mapping and classifying fires. And basically, it's completely and utterly shambolic. Because it's shambolic, we actually don't know the the cause, the the consequences of these fires, because that's just the area burnt. We don't know the severity, the intensity. So what we need is nationally consistent data on extent and severity. We need data on the historical context of the fire regimes, the economic costs, the causes, whether it was arson or lightning, the biodiversity impacts. We need consistent mapping. We need to understand carbon stocks, emission factors, fuel loads, and smoke exposure. And basically, it's completely chaotic. It's all been done piecemeal between competing uh, approaches, competing teams, competing states, no national consistency, therefore no coherence, therefore uh, an impossibility of putting out political dispute about what this fire event really was about. So there is an opportunity. The Australian government has uh, commissioned a Royal Commission, which is the highest uh, uh, inquiry uh, for the Australian government. It has incredible powers. Uh, it can summons evidence. Um, indeed, I was summoned to give evidence. Um, and it asks very deep and profound questions about legislative reform, the need for legislative uh, and social innovation, uh, improving environmental management, recognising Aboriginal past and present practices, trying to understand how to put 
fire management into some sort of economic sustainability. But most fundamentally, it's begging the question of evidence-based fire management. But I would argue you can't do that without data. What, in fact, the Royal Commission is going to do is put a dragnet through opinion. It's going to collect a lot of opinion, <clears throat> but it won't know how much of that opinion is just opinion, sensation, and how much of it is actually uh, evidence and, and you know, in, uh, evidence that can be relied on to build policy. So what is adaptive thinking? What do we need to do to get out of the, the, the global uh, fire crisis we're in? What I think we need to do is we actually need to completely reimagine fire management, to go back to the beginning and ask ourselves, what is the mess we're in and, and what do we want to envisage? How could we make a better world? Because without a clear vision statement, without good data, we're just rowing around in circles. <clears throat> and I think a really good example of this is the cultural burning event, which is occurring at the moment in Australia, a huge issue politically, that Aboriginal people are standing up and saying, hang on, we, we are a stakeholder in this. We have an ancient practice and an ancient tradition. You must engage with us now because you're failing to manage this landscape. A very fascinating book has just been published by an Aboriginal man, Victor Stephofferson, How Indigenous Fire Management Could Help Save Australia. Now, I think this aspirational vision is fantastic, but there's a danger that if that vision becomes decoupled from evidence, we have to ground our vision in evidence. We need nationally consistent data. We need evidence-based policy. So to conclude, we, we are going to adapt to a global fire crisis, and there is a global fire crisis. I assure you, I've lived through one. And this is going to require holistic thinking about the environmental, the social, the historical context. It requires data collection and analysis. It requires economic analyses. It requires cro cross-cultural research, engagement with different communities that have been marginalized. And most fundamentally, it requires synthetic and holistic thinking that spans biophysical and social domains. So that's what I call pyrogeography. That's what I think adaptive thinking is. And that will lead to pyrogeographic practice and it will lead to pyrogeographic outcomes and it will create a virtuous circle. Thank you. Thanks a lot, David. That was really interesting talk. And um, I see that we have a question um, to you. And that's uh, uh, concerning the, the data collection in Australia. So uh, what do you think is the course uh, for having these uh, different numbers and different, um, yeah, uh, different type of data around? So Australia is a country where you uh, uh, experience frequent um, fires, uh, not just last year but, or last summer, but um, regularly. So why are these uh, data collections so difficult? Uh, so the reason for the complexity of the data is that because we are a federation of former British colonies, each state and territory has, has actually developed its own systems. And this crisis this summer brought this problem into a head because the fires did not recognise the state borders. Normally, the geographical domain of a fire would be just within a state and therefore there would be an internally consistent body of data. But this fire actually demanded, and that's why there's a Royal Commission, demanded a national perspective because mm -hmm. the state perspective was completely uh, overwhelmed because these fires were occurring simultaneously in, in different states. There was no human being other than maybe the people, the astronauts, who could actually have a, a really coherent perspective of what was happening in Australia. There was so much happening at once and there was no national centre to make sense of all of the, the data input. Okay, then um, 
we move or have to move over to the next speaker and um thank you. I, yeah thanks david sorry <laughs> good so now it's Faye johnson's uh, uh floor here um she is a a, a doctor and working at the uh, menzies institute for medical research at the university of tasmania and she will provide us uh, some um, insight on human health issues related to the smoke. And we are really happy that you could join us here because you are also working in parallel on the COVID-19, which is also important. So even more in, uh, nice that you are with us here. So. Thank you. Thanks for that introduction. And um, thanks for having me. Lovely to be here. I'm mostly going to talk about a quick analysis we did of the smoke from the recent summer fires. Um, I've spent a lot of time thinking about public health impacts of fires and of course there are very many impacts from loss of housing, loss of livelihoods, loss of infrastructure and power, for example. Um, the mental health trauma of living through a severe event. Um, so the uh, impacts on health manifest in very many different ways. Um, and one of the ones that is sometimes less obvious but um, quite important is the smoke generated by the fires and that's something I've been working on for some time. Um, so what I'll do now, because um, our last season illustrated this uh, quite dramatically, is just share with you what we did at the time to try and understand how big the impacts were um, across Australia and compare that to the previous 20 fire seasons. Uh, so I'll walk through what we did. So I'll give a bit of background. My background is health, not fire or geography. So it'll be uh, brief, but I'll give a bit of context, explain how I calculated health and economic impacts, and then show the previous uh, 20 years. So the setting here is Australia, and I, I have a simplistic view of Australia. Um, in the north, it's tropical. And the fires there are dry season in our winter months and they tend to be small, they're savanna fires. They're important for carbon emissions and area burned, but they're less important for public health impacts because so few people live in the north and they tend to be small and not cause the huge disasters. So my talk is going to be entirely about the severe fires we get in the temperate south. Uh, where we get large, dense forests of largely eucalypt trees. And in the next slide uh, just walks through what, what I did. And I'll show you another slide first. But basically, we had a lot of fires over summer. Uh, how unusual were they was a recurrent question. Certainly, the smoke was more extreme than anything I've experienced in um, 20 years of studying smoke. Um, so what we did was step one, um, we had to try and work out exactly how much smoke there was and how many people got exposed and how bad it was for how long in each city affected by the smoke. And in fact, it was 90% of the population of Australia that got some smoke at some point. Um, then work out the health outcomes. And smoke has a lot of impacts. It's subtle. It's subtle until you're already vulnerable because you have asthma or because you have heart disease or you're at high risk of a heart attack and then your body's response to the stress of the smoke can cause your asthma to get worse. That one's obvious. You can feel how irritating the smoke is, but it can make your blood more likely to clot and cause a heart attack or a stroke. Um, and most deaths relating to smoke are in fact more to do with the heart than to do with the lungs. Um, and these relationships have been studied Smoke's got hundreds of chemicals, but the one that drives the vast majority of health impacts are the suspended particles, often abbreviated to PM, particulate matter, and the relationships between the amount of particles in the air and health outcomes like death rates have been studied for years and they're, they're well established. And whether they come from traffic or come from smoke, the uh, the relationships are remarkably consistent. So you can, if you know the amount of smoke and how many people are affected, you can actually get a reasonably good estimate of what happened in the population even before you've had time to get the health data sets and analyse them carefully. And then you can use standard economic approaches for attributing a cost. And that's a helpful thing to do because in the context of fire disasters, it's often quite rare costs of suppression, costs of loss of housing, 
are routinely quantified, um, it's less common to work out the cost of the smoke. Uh, so to give you some more context, here's one estimate of area burned in the top left. And I'm only now showing data for the southern half of Australia. And the top right is the population density. So you can see the population is along the east and the south. And that matched very closely where the vast majority of the fires were. There were some fires in the desert where nobody lives. There were some fires in the west. Uh, but it was an almost perfect match of 80% of our population with this huge area burned. So we took um, air stations, all these blue dots on the bottom left, uh, where the monitors that measure the amount of smoke. And if there was a monitor that was in a statistical area used by our um, census, our Bureau of Statistics, or one nearby, um, we took data for the last 20 years. Uh, but we, that's how we just defined our study period. It was where there was access to air quality data for many years um, in the populated centres. But in fact, we monitor air quality where people live and this approach captured 90% of Australians just with those areas shaded on the bottom right hand side. Uh, and then if you combine this data to get a population weighted average, David showed you this figure. The orange line at the bottom is our usual background in summer. Uh, the red line is our air quality standard and the blue line is the daily average exposure for all Australians. So um, this is quite dramatic. It doesn't look dramatic, it only goes to 100. But in fact, the smoke moved. So some places were experiencing like a thousand, like a thousand times background. Uh, while other places were okay, and then the smoke would move somewhere else. So this is the daily average for the whole country or our whole study period. Um, so having it elevated for this many months affecting so many people is actually quite a dramatic um, difference from any previous year. Um, and this is how we applied the health impacts, as I mentioned before, the relationships, relative risk. If you look at the heading, of the column on the right hand side, RR per 10, that's the relative risk per 10 unit increase in the particulate concentration, the measure of smoke. And roughly, uh, they've actually all got very similar risk relationships and it's roughly a 1% increase in deaths, a 1% increase in admissions to hospital for heart disease and admissions to hospital for lung disease per 10 unit rise. So our, our background level is about six. A 10 unit rise takes us to 16. A 20 unit rise would take us to our air quality standard. And then we managed to exceed that by another order of magnitude. Um, the only difference is for asthma emergency department attendances, uh, it's a 6% rise. It's a much stronger relationship with lung outcomes uh, generally than with other outcomes. And then each of these had a cost, and these were standard units that the Australian Hospital Pricing Authority will pay to a hospital for one admission for a cardiovascular problem, and that's $7,000. And they'll pay a similar amount for a admission for a respiratory problem. For an emergency department visit, they'll pay 700, that's a lot cheaper. And then deaths were valued using the value of a statistical life, which in Australian dollars is 4.4 million. This is based on willingness to pay, to delay death. It's not based on age or underlying health status or how much longer you might have to live, but it's a standard way of valuing death, used globally and used in very similar assessments. So it's a, it's a way of giving context. Um, it's not really intended to be truth, but you can add up all these costs and then you've got a way of comparing health impacts across years with one single figure that incorporates both death and hospital use. And I might just add at this point, this assessment we did was based on where we do have good data and known relationships. There's an awful lot of other health impacts where we don't understand the relationships, like attendances to a family physician or loss of work time, or some rare diseases, infections that might be associated with smoke. Um, so they're not included in this assessment. 
Okay, sorry, three tables in a row. Uh, for the season that began, it went over our summer. It began in, well, the first fires really began at the end of July, which is in the middle of our winter. We had some peat bogs that had dried out so much that caught fire. Uh, and then we had early fires a bit south of those peat bogs. This was in New South Wales. And then they just grew rapidly with many more fires, eventually affecting nearly every state in the, um, in the country. So it was over uh, the fire season, a five month period, we calculated uh, 1,156 admissions to hospital for cardiovascular problems. So their problems like a heart attack or a stroke or an abnormal heart rhythm. Um, we calculated a 2,084 excess admissions for lung problems, respiratory problems, like asthma or pneumonia or chronic lung disease. And we calculated 1,333 um, excess visits for asthma to an emergency department and 431 um, deaths, premature deaths, um, all attributable to the smoke from these fires. So this removed any impact of background air pollution, and these were what were attributable to the fires. Um, and then the costs, of course, are dominated by the costs of premature mortality because that's valued um, so much uh, greater than, than the healthcare costs. This um, figure shows the cumulative costs, so the dollar value day by day throughout every fire season for the last 20 years. So the line in red shows the most recent fire season um, where you can see the rapid increase and it plateaus at about 2 billion Australian dollars. And then with the previous 15 seasons, they're all considerably lower. And in fact, most of them are about an order of magnitude. They're between zero and $200 million. Then there were five other big seasons, our previous one, 2002 to 2003 and then a complete anomaly in the smoke and health impacts that we got in the previous year. Okay and here's another way of seeing the same thing showing year by year the costs and this shows the different states of Australia and we can see the biggest impacts in New South Wales and Victoria which are the two most populated states with very dense forests close to a lot of people. Um, so this kind of analysis isn't truth, it's an estimate of impacts. Um, there's a lot of work that's coming out of this um, and a lot of epidemiological studies and that they will be essential, um, including some of the big unknowns in health risks. Uh, what happens if you're pregnant and get severe smoke exposure or very young? What does the future hold for you? There have been almost no studies following people through time after living through a big pollution event like this. Um, so the epidemiology and the work to come is going to be essential. But it does give us a ballpark estimate. It does enable us to compare with previous episodes. Um, but just a reminder that there's always limitations. The way we estimated the exposure was averaging ground-based monitors because we haven't, there's many techniques you can use, satellite data, chemical transport modeling, um, but we didn't have access to those for the rapidly or for the entire 20 year period. Um, the response functions, the coefficients we used and all the other health out, outcomes we weren't able to measure uh, are not a part of this analysis. Um, but I think we can say it was an unprecedented season. The impacts were enormous. Um, it seemed to be a watershed in perceptions in the community of the problem with climate change, what climate change might actually mean in reality um, for people's lives. Um, and many epidemiologists and health and politicians became interested in fire smoke epidemiology, which is a good thing because it's only going to increase. Um, so I think uh, I can leave it there. Thank you very much. And I'm sorry ab about the internet. <laughs> Thank you, Faye. And yeah, the internet is of course not your <laughs> problem, but so just uh, a, a really quick question uh, um, that uh, was coming up in the, in the box. 
Um, so what is the relationship between the exposure to the PM 2.5 and the heart problems? So can you answer maybe quickly on that? Why is that related to heart issues? Uh, the mechanism? Yes. Um, so when you breathe in, so these particles are tiny. Uh, they go into your lungs, they can move into the bloodstream. The body recognises them as it might recognise a virus or an injury. It, it will stimulate the defence systems, the immune systems of the body. Uh, and that has many um, good things about it because if there's a germ or a bacteria, it will kill it. Um, it will bring more blood. If you're bleeding to death, it will help you because it will make your blood clot uh, more easily. Uh, but it, all those responses that can help you in one situation can harm you in another situation. So it causes a lot of inflammation. Um, it makes the blood more likely to clot. If you're already at high risk of a heart attack, maybe because you smoke, maybe because you're unlucky with your genetics, it can be what precipitates your heart attack or your stroke. Uh, it can make your heartbeat become irregular and can cause death through that pathway. Um, so through very small changes in a normal system, for people at high risk, smoke nearly always uh, will affect people at high risk. It's unusual for healthy people to have a problem that they don't recover from, except maybe if they're a newborn baby and their systems are still delivering, uh, de developing. Uh, but really it will set off a serious event. So it's uncommon, but when an entire population is exposed, there are so many of us at high risk of a heart attack, for example, that you will get a measurable increase in these kind of problems. Okay. Yeah, thanks a lot. Uh, okay. And then we move over to um, the next speaker, and I will also hand over to Gita uh, Laszlo, introducing the speaker. Hello, yeah. everyone. And I will just put up a screen. Uh, well, yes. Welcome to the webinar, also from my side. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce the next speaker, who is Guido van der Werf, and he's a full professor at the Free University of Amsterdam. You can see some information on this uh, slide here. And he really did groundbreaking research about the role of fire on the global carbon cycle. His uh, work is mainly based on remote sensing and he generated uh, remote sensing data sets and contributed to the development of remote sensing data sets that really form a basis for many fields of research for ecologists, but also for uh, people who try to uh, model fire occurrence and also as input data sets for atmospheric science. So it's really a great pleasure that he um, agreed that he would contribute to the symposium. And um, he will talk today about um, fire climate interactions in a warming world. Well, thanks, Gita. These kind of words. Let's see if we get this going. Um, so my talk today will be um, basically about uh, global maps of emissions, burnt area, uh, and I like to put the, try to put the year 2019 in perspective. So this work we're doing with the GFAT team, and GFAT is the Global Fire Emissions Database. Um, we meet every two weeks and we always start with uh, maps of burnt area, trying to see what we can improve on those, and that's a lot of work done by Louis Giglio and Jim Anderson. And for the people not familiar with these maps, the, the things, that you really immediately see are the Savannah State pop out, 50-100% burning every year. Um, the lower bar basically shows the fire return time, so everything in red burns frequently. And then if you go move towards the forest, you see less frequent burning. But, but the thing that struck me always here is like, hey, the whole world basically burns once in a while. The problem is that we don't know the actual burnt area. This is, uh, these are a few uh, graphs showing what we think is going on. So this is some older data from MODIS, uh, relatively large fires are detected really well by this data. We see about 300 million hectares globally burned. So that's the size of India, for example. But at some point we realized, oh, we realized that there's a lot of 
small fires being undetected by this burnt area. So people start to incorporate this, and more recent estimates of burnt area are a little bit higher, etc. But the key question is still, what is the actual burnt area? We map large fires reasonably well, but we have problems with the smaller ones. Some information on how this may, might look like may come from Africa. We have the same sequence, we have some older burnt area data sets, then we include small fires, and we see the, fire, uh, the burnt area increases, and the most recent burnt area data based on cost resolution data already shows a little bit of an increase. But for Africa, we do have some estimates of the full burnt area. This is work uh, done by the fire CCI uh, based on what data done. And you see over here, there's actually a pretty big increase in burnt area if you include all those small fires. So that's really cutting edge research. I think over the next years, we have multiple global burnt area based on this high quality, uh, relatively high resolution data. So that's the first step if you want to get emissions, uh, uh, burnt area, and then we have to multiply them with uh, the, basically the biomass load. You can imagine that the fire in a savannah releases much less emissions per unit burnt area than a fire in a forest. And that's the map shown over here, where you see basically inverse relation with burnt area. Places that burn very frequently, in general burnt grasses, so the emissions per unit burnt area are lower. If we combine the two previous maps, so burnt area, multiply them with the fuel consumption, you get actually what I'm be talking about the rest of uh, this talk, is emissions. You recognize the patterns that were shown in the first graph of burnt area, but what really stands out now is that the forests have uh, larger values, so they have relatively low burnt area, but because of so much fuel consumption, they really pop up here. You can also look, for example, at Indonesia, where you have very high fuel consumption because you only burn, also burn the organic soils, and the same applies to some regions in the boil. So this is a map of average over the last 20 years. And let's move on to 2019. The map shown over here is basically what happened in 2019 related to what happened in the previous years. Everything in blue shows lower burnt area or lower emissions than the climatology. And the thing that really stands out, for example, are the savannah regions. And that's part of an ongoing trend where we see uh, basically frequently burning savannas being converted to agricultural land, which leads to a decline in burnt area. So that's been going on over at least the past 20 years and probably uh, longer periods. So you see a lot of area, but there's less emissions in 2019 compared to other years. However, if you look a little bit more in detail, and let's do this in a chronological sequence, you see in 2019, first of all, you had high fire emissions in uh, Siberia, pretty far north, actually in the Arctic Circle. Then the Amazon came in the news with uh, relatively high emissions, Indonesia as well, and of course, what we just heard about, uh, Australia topped everything. So let's go and have a look at those regions. And the first thing I'd like to sort of show is how important the length of a time series is. Because I think one of the reasons why uh, South America was so much in the news was basically this news report by BBC saying that Amazon fires increased by more than 80%. And that's also what we see in the data. If you compare 2018, 2019, we see an increase of 80%. But if you look at the longer records, you see that 2019 was not, not as anomalous as you would expect from, um, uh, from the news reports. And if you go even further back in time, you see that over other years, they were substantially higher. And then if you get the full observational record, and this is starting in 97, based on satellite data and going back using proxy data, for example, visibility, you see that 2019 was a relatively high fire year, but it wasn't a record year. You see an overall increase over the last decades, and this is something you see in other regions as well. But you also see that 2019 growth was not as exceptional as you should think. However, it doesn't mean that there was nothing going on. Because if you look at the Brazilian Amazon, the big fire years, for example, 2005, 2007, 2010, you see high emissions because there's a drought that leading to a lot of fires. But for the rest, it's mostly driven by uh, deforestation. 
and see deforestation declined after the 2000s and in the most recent years you see deforestation increasing again and that's what, what we're worried about basically that the increase in fires that we see now are related to more deforestation. The length of fire record is also important, for example, if you look at Alaska, if you look at uh, the GFAT time series, so 97 through now, you see a lot of variability from year to year, but it's difficult to say whether fires are on the rise or not. But if you include earlier years, and this is based on Lancer data, you do see that the last decades were definitely uh, higher fire than uh, previous decades. That's partly related to warming. Some of Arthur Baker, for example, looked at this and also showing that it's not just warming leading to a longer dry season and drier fuels, but also because of more lightning, you get more fires. So the length of the fire record really matters. The last three regions I'd like to look at is uh, Siberia, Indonesia, and Australia. Just put them in perspective, what happened in 2019 compared to earlier years. So Russia, if you look at all of Russia, 2019 was a high fire year, but not exceptional. But what I've done is I tried to see which part of the fires were happening actually in the Arctic region. And then you suddenly see that 2019 was really exceptional. There's an increase in trend in fires, and 2019 was by far larger than any other year. In Indonesia, you really see the influence of El Nino. All the big fire years are big El Ninos. Uh, Except 2019, this was actually one of the first years when you had a relatively high fire year that was not related to El Nino. For Australia, we just heard about, uh, you see in dark blue basically uh, the fires more in the northern part of the country, uh, no savannah fires that burn very frequently, but then you see also the part of South Wales and Victoria where you really had an exceptional fire year. So to some degree, 2019 was unprecedented, definitely in the Arctic, definitely in South Australia's forests. But what made 2019 so special was that a lot of regions had anomalous fire emissions. So normally you, every year has you know, some region that burns more than average. 2019 just saw a combination of many regions that burned much more than we used to. And that brings me basically to, to my final set of slides. Um, what I've done is make time series starting with burnt area and just normalize them. And this is you know, something that has been known for a few years. Uh, quite a few papers have been studying this, saying, okay, there's a decline in burnt area. And that's basically driven by savannas, mostly in Africa and South America. If you look at emissions, then you get a little bit of a different story. Yes, there's a decline, and it depends with what time series you take 97, 98 into account, but you see that the decline is much smaller than the decline in burnt area. And if you look, for example, at something like carbon monoxide emissions, that really bears um, a signal of incomplete combustion in forests and organic soil, you see actually there's a slight increase, although I guess the, the, the statistics are really poor, but the key message here is, is that the global decline we see in burnt area is not accompanied by a global decline in emissions. And the reason, the underlying reason basically is that savannas are driving this burnt area signal, but other regions, for example, forests are driving the emissions. So there's a compensating effect with a decline in savannas leading to lower emissions. At the same time, you see probably an increase, especially if you take the 70s and 80s, etc., into account in both deforestation zones and some uh, of the more boreal forest regions. Brings me to my conclusion, I think biogeography, depending on how you define it, but it has been changing over the past decades and I think it will continue to do so. So then fires, you see a decrease related to increased um, population density, at the same time, forest fires are on the rise, both in deforestation zones, the rise has been mostly from the 60s, 70s towards the current periods, but also uh, there's a lot of literature now showing that in the, in the boreal region, we see more fires, also something like the temperate region, for example, Australia, we see more fires than we saw in the past. Also means that the length of the fire record really matters. I showed the example, for example, for South America, if you focus on two years in a very variable system, it's very difficult to say something about long-term trends. I think 2019 was exceptional, 
And basically because you see multiple regions that had above average fire dimensions. So it's not just something we see in, in other years, where sometimes Indonesia burns more, sometimes South America burns more. In 2019, you see that several peak fire regions really burn more. And maybe a final note, um, I guess this is far from perfect and I hope to see everybody in person soon, but I think we as a scientific community really have to think like, hey, can we improve on this kind of meetings and make sure that we keep our uh, CO2 levels low. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Guido, for this very uh, interesting uh, insight in what you learned uh, based on the remote sensing over the last couple of years. So there's one um, question by Zeb Breitenbach, and um, he's asking whether you can allude a bit to fire intensity, um, which is certainly also an important aspect of, of fire regimes. Have you also looked into fire intensity measures, or can you draw conclusions on fire intensity based on your analysis? Uh, not really on our analysis. I mean, there are quite a few people, including David Bowman, for example, they looked at FRP and they see that, that per unit fire basically intensity increase in some regions. Um, but I'm not the person to, to say something conclusive about this. And then another quick question maybe um, is by Benjamin Bellwald. Um, how does it, how do C or CO2 emissions by forest fires compare with the fossil uh, CO2 emissions? Yeah, what we estimate that CO2 emissions from fires in total are about 20% of global fossil fuel emissions. But that, that's not a fair comparison because, uh, for example, Savannah fire, you get CO2 emissions and then the, the consecutive wet season the CO2 will be taken up by regrowth. So if you want to do a fair comparison, you should only take the deforestation fires into account and that's about 5% of total global fossil fuel emissions. Yeah, then thank you again for taking the time and preparing the presentation, answering the questions. And then I would like to continue with our next speaker, who's uh, uh, Christina Santin. Yeah, Christina is an uh, associate uh, professor at the Swansea University in UK, and her research focuses on the impact of fire on soil and hydrology. And um, she's doing field work, as you can see in this uh, nice picture, but she also connects to uh, doing uh, research on the global scale. So she provided a very nice review on the fate of solid pyrogenic carbon. Um, and um, yeah, with her work, she bridges between local and global scales, but also between, for instance, soil science and atmospheric sciences. And so today she will talk about uh, what happens after the fire. Thank you, Ita. And let me see if I can do this correctly. Yeah, so can you hear me well? Yeah. So good morning, everyone. And thanks to the conveners for organizing this fire symposium and for inviting me <coughs> to participate. I want to talk a little bit about some of the environmental effects of fire. And I'm going to do that by using two of the main uh, actors after the fire, and these are charcoal and ash. Uh, before that, I could like to remark that fire can have many forms. Um, we have seen that uh, in the previous talks already. So we can have these devastating, huge, intense wildfires, but we can also have low intensity uh, natural wildfires. And of course, we also have many different um, forms of man-made fire. So because fire is a different range of things, it can also lead to a different and wide range of environment, uh, environmental effects. Uh, today, uh, I'm not going to talk about effects in animals and plants. I think uh, Orsi is going to cover some of that in her talk uh, next. And I'm not going to talk uh, either about uh, the impact on soils that can be really, really important. Um, so as I said, I'm going to focus on something else, but also I included here in this slide, some pictures to remind us that not all the environmental effects of fires are actually negative. And in many ecosystems around the world, fire is an important part of their natural cycle. And actually some key animal and uh, plant species need fire to survive. 
So moving on now to the um, topic of this talk, uh, charcoal and ash in a post-fire landscape. I chose this because these are quite ubiquitous in the uh, post-fire environment. So if I ask all of you to imagine a landscape that has been uh, burned, it doesn't really matter what type of landscape and what type of fire you choose, uh, but I'm pretty sure you all will have some ash and some uh, black char stuff uh, around. So let's start with the black component. So the fire-derived organic materials after a fire are, again, they are a huge range of uh, components. They can be tiny little particles that go into the smoke as soot or black carbon. They can also be tiny particles that go into the water like dissolved black carbon or we can have the typical charcoal that we can see in this picture here uh, coming from a uh, good. But all of them, uh, we tend to talk about them as pharmacogenic carbon, so they comprise all of them in one single word. So pyrogenic carbon has uh, many effects in the post-fire environment. And I'm going to just uh, talk briefly about three of the, I think are the key ones uh, regarding the uh, pyrogenic carbon mechanical functions. Uh, to start with, the most probably, or at least to me, the most important and for sure the, the best studied is the carbon sequestration ability of pyrogenic carbon. Um, what is this? So uh, through burning, through charring, uh, the plant molecules become more chemically recalcitrant and that means that uh, it's more difficult for the microorganisms to, de to degrade these molecules. So when this uh, material gets into soils, into sediments and into waters, many times, not all of them, but a big proportion of them, we take longer to degrade than the unburned materials, and therefore they can be seen as an additional carbon sink. So it, they have carbon sequestration potential. So this is important to have into account because it's true that a huge proportion of the carbon is emitted by fire, as Guido explained earlier, but we have also some carbon that is actually uh, going into the environment to be stored for lo longer periods of time. This is just an example so a soil profile with a type of layers that are up to 8,000 years old. So another important uh, function of pyrogenic carbon is uh, due to the high uh, bio oil it will improve the water holding capacity of the soil, the gas exchanges in the soil. And as you can see in this picture over here, sometimes it can even help as a refuge for some microbes. So in a nutshell, it's sometimes, and again, it's not always, but many times it increases microbial activity in soils. The third uh, mecha important mechanical function of pyrogenic carbon is through sorption reactions. And this is really important because it will affect a lot of biochemical cycles in the environment, a cycling of nutrients, organic compounds, and it also changes the decomposition of the native soil organic matter in soils. So it makes sometimes, it makes uh, this uh, organic matter uh, decompose, decomposing uh, faster and sometimes uh, slower. And I really like this picture over here because this is an experiment that was done a hundred years ago uh, or a bit more, where it actually proved that by including charcoal in the soil, you can also have an increase of plant productivity. It is also important, although it's not so well studied, that uh, pyrogenic carbon can be also a source of pollutants like uh, uh, polyaromatic hydrocarbons, but also very recently with uh, Gabriel Sigmund from Vienna University, we have been looking at 
the concentrations of the environmental persistent free radicals in charcoal. So these are new new trends that are starting in research and that they, I, I'm sure they will be further developed. So this is my last slide talking about the black component of pyrogenic carbon and it's about uh, its global significance. And I wanted to put this here because over the last decade or so, there have been quite a lot of debate whether pyrogenic carbon is important enough in quantitative and in global terms to really worth considering. And we did this study uh, last year with Guido. So we use uh, Guido's uh, GFES database to produce the first spatially and graphically production around the world. And you can see here that the amount of pyrogenic carbon produced every year is equivalent to around 11% of the carbon that is emitted by fire. So I think this uh, really proves that this uh, the global significance of pyrogenic carbon. So if we now move into the white component, the ash, I, I have to start by saying that ash is not always white. So it, it can be sometimes, like in this picture, when you have um, a very complete combustion of the fuel. But generally speaking, what we have is more what we can see in this other picture, where ash or wildfire, wildland uh, fire ash is a mix of mineral and char organic material. So it can actually have a lot of pyrogenic carbon in it. So talking about on-site environmental effect of ash, the main one is actually an increase of soil fertility. And this is because when we have, um, so the nutrients that are in the vegetation, when the vegetation burns, most of the carbon, oxygen, and hydrogen is emitted, but most of the other elements get actually concentrated into ash. So these nutrients uh, can improve soil fertility, as I said, and also ash has a very high pH, what can lead to limin effect that is important, especially for um, poor acidic soils. And this knowledge is actually not new at all because it's the underlying principle of the traditional agricultural practice of slash and burn. So basically where people burn their crops and let the ash there to help fertilize in the next uh, generation of um, crops. But because the ash has really uh, high concentrations of many different elements, it's also a very important pollution source. And this is especially relevant if we consider the off-site environmental effect of ash. So let's imagine, let's go back to our uh, post-fire landscape. We have this uh, ash layer on the ground that is highly mobile, it's going to be moved with uh, wind and also with water. And when this happens, it can lead at a lot of different environmental effects. Just to give a few examples here. Uh, it has already been proved that ash can actively be involved in the generation of debris flows, as in this picture here. It can also lead to really negative impact on freshwater ecosystems. I don't know if you can see it, but this, these are all fish that are dead. This was uh, this happened in Australia a few months ago after the. Um, the fire and the rains after the fire uh, took a lot of ash and sediment into the river, uh, basically suffocating the fish. And also, ash has, uh, it can be an important threat uh, for drinking water. So this is a picture of, um, again, in Australia, a reservoir uh, that had a lot of input uh, of ash after a fire and because we have seen that ash is really enriched in nutrients it can increase the alga uh, growth and even yeah get into as we can see here alga blooms that obviously have really nasty consequences for drinking water I just want to finish uh, my presentation with an example coming back to Australia sadly enough uh, it's quite yeah, we all need to talk about this unprecedented fire season. And I want to show 
you hear, this was one of the fires in January uh, 2020 that burned really close to Sydney. And if you can see here in blue, this is the main or the largest uh, water reservoir for the whole Sydney. Uh, it burned around 30% of the catchment, this, this specific fire. And probably as you all know too, after the Australian fires, they also, they also experienced a record torrential rains. So again, if we think about all these ash that we have now in the, in the landscape, and this is highly mobile, what happened is a lot of it was a transport within the landscape and eventually into the reservoir. So in this picture over here, you can see that the water is actually pretty dark because of all the floating material, many of it, uh, much of it pyrogenic, that was in the surface of, uh, of the reservoir. So our research group was uh, and is still working very closely with the water company there. So we were trying to help them um, anticipating the potential implications for drinking water. They are prepared because uh, this area of Australia, as we have seen, is quite fire prone. And even if the, these were unprecedented fire, they had already mechanisms that they could put in place. So this, for example, was um, a boom net just to try to stop the sediment advancing into the reservoir. And they had many other um, mechanisms that I can't discuss here, but anyway, made the, the uh, water closer to the dam not that affected by, by the ash. So I wanted to finish with this slide because again, this is an unprecedented event, but we are seeing more of this and we'll be seeing more and more of this in the future and not only in these fire prone areas that at least to at a extent, they are adapted to fire. We are starting to see this in other areas as um, Kido show where fire is not so common. So we really need to get ready and prepare for this. So that's all from my end. Uh, thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much, Christina, for this uh, presentation on these important impacts of ash and charcoal. And I think it again highlights the, the need for interdisciplinary research also and the um, importance of having such a symposium here. And so the first question that I would like to ask you is by Lopke Rotteveel. And um, the question is, how long does the fertilizing effect last after fires? Well, it's, that's a really good question. Uh, it doesn't last very long. So the, the increase in nutrients, maybe for a few weeks and months, and the pH effect can, can last for a bit longer, maybe up to a couple of years, but these, these effects are usually a short term. And then maybe another quick question by Sepp Breitenbach. Uh, it's about the global distribution map of pyrogenic carbon that you showed. And he's asking, how do you measure pyrogenic carbon globally? Yeah, so um, this study that again we did with Guido and John, um, John Matthews was uh, the main uh, author in it. So what we did was to compile a, da a database with our own field data and also data from previous studies from all around the, the, world, uh, the world. So different pyrogenic carbon uh, figures for many ecosystems. And of course, uh, the database was very good, but was not complete. So we had to make some assumptions and extrapolations. But uh, so basically it's coming from only a uh, field, uh, field data. And I would, I would really like to continue asking these questions. So thanks to everyone who is uh, putting up these questions here. But uh, I think we should uh, move to our last speaker. Our last speaker is Oshoya um, Valko. And um, she is a research group leader at the Center for Ecology in Hungary. And her research complements the talks before by investigating the role of fire in landscape management and nature conservation. 
And this, with this, we include in the symposium, beside climate change, also a link to another grand societal challenge, and that is the loss of biodiversity. And um, so hopefully she may also give some insights how the global fire crisis can be faced in the future. And so in her talk, she will explain to us the contradictory role of fire in nature conservation. Thank you very much, Gita, for the introduction. And uh, uh, in my talk, I would like to uh, introduce the uh, differential role of fire in nature conservation and uh, tell you some examples about our research related to the fire effects on plants and animals. So as we all know, uh, fire is a globally very relevant disturbance and uh, for the uh, point of view for, uh, of the animals and plants, it's a very important biomass consumer and also it alters the biogeochemical bio cycles in uh, several ways. Uh, that is why many plant and animal species develop several different evolutionary adaptations to cope with fire and to coexist with fire, as uh, it was already said by David and uh, Christina. And there are uh, many fire prone ecosystems worldwide. But uh, in our era, uh, there are several human induced changes in the fire regimes. So we people uh, modify, for example, the ignition probability of the fires uh, uh, due to the global climate change and uh, due to the global change of fuel availability. Uh, there are a lot of uh, human induced changes in the ignition probability. Also, we change uh, fire regimes in several ways uh, through the land use changes and the uh, human mediated changes in the landscape composition. And uh, also, uh, there are several direct human effects on the fire uh, regimes, uh, such as uh, we set a lot of arson, the technical fires, illegal burning. And of course, the fire suppression measures are also important in, in uh, current fire uh, regimes. And what are the effects of fire uh, on the flora and fauna? Uh, we can categorize the effect to two major groups. Uh, the first order effects include the uh, immediate effects, for example, the death or injury of uh, the plant or animal individuals, uh, which can be very detrimental for the individuals, but can uh, have different uh, effects on the population. level. And also there are several second order fire effects, uh, which, uh, which modify the environment of the plants and animals. For example, modify the microclimate, the microbial activity, the productivity, and many other things. So uh, the uh, effect of fire on the flora and fauna depend on two major components, um, the biotic factors and the fire regimes uh, and uh, their interaction. So what are these biotic factors? For example, several attributes of the ecosystems, the phenology, mobility, adaptations, and regeneration potential of the plants and animals. And these interact with the fire regime components. For example, if you look at these uh, nice bird species, the lapwing, it can uh, easily escape from a fire when it is adult and it can fly. But uh, of course, the chicks cannot uh, easily escape. So this is, this is an example of the interaction of the biotic factors and the fire regime components. Uh, let's see some examples from our researches. For example, uh, the fire frequency. So in, um, in these nice uh, foothill uh, uh, steppe grasslands in Hungary, we found that uh, very frequent and yearly burning leads to the uh, very uh, important degradation of these grasslands. Uh, we found that uh, if we burn the grasslands annually, then uh, the biomass of weed and disturbance tolerant plant species increases and the biomass of speci specialist plant species, which are the most important for the conservation, it decreases. Uh, but in the same ecosystem, uh, fire can also have a positive effect. So for example, we found that um, if uh, the fire is not in every year, just occasional, uh, it decreases significantly the amount of litter. And this decreased amount of litter can be very uh, good and it can support the germination of specialist and protected plant species, such as this very nice uh, flower, Posadilla grandis. Uh, another example is uh, about the timing of the fire. These uh, pictures show uh, several uh, uh, endangered and protected uh, uh, plant species, early spring, early, early spring geophytes, which are protected at the European level. And uh, if the fire occurs in the early spring, uh, it can help their germination. If the fire occurs when this species are flowering, then uh, it can be very detrimental for them. And an interesting fact that, for example, in Central Europe, many people uh, just do illegal burns uh, during the Easter time. So it's very important in the calendar what time is the Easter, 
if, if uh, Easter is uh, early in the spring, it, it, it's not so detrimental for the plant species, but uh, if it's in the late spring, then uh, many species can uh, be damaged by the illegal burning. Uh, another example of the, for the timing of the fire, uh, this uh, bird species is the great bastard, the largest European bird species, which is uh, endangered and protected. And uh, it's a ground breeding bird. So if the fire occurs in the nesting season, it's very detrimental for it. But we found that if the fire uh, occurs in early spring, it uh, creates very optimal sites for uh, mating of the species and it can be very good for it. Uh, another example is about the extent and severity of, of the fire uh, in this very nice uh, open landscape in uh, eastern Hungary. We found that burning in small plots, 50 by 50 mm -hmm. meters in the dormant season, can be very good for the nature conservation viewpoint. Uh, we found increased plant diversity, more flowering shoots, decreased litter, increased green biomass after this small scale burning. And it did not affect uh, negatively the soil dwelling arthropods because they could easily escape and uh, recolonize these small burnt plots. But in the same ecosystem, if there is a very large and severe fire, then it can cause very, uh, very uh, large changes and higher mortality rate. And it's very difficult for the animals to recolonize the large burnt areas. So if we know these uh, facts about the fire regimes and uh, their interactions with the ecosystem attributes, we can um, uh, use the fire wisely for protecting uh, several components of the biodiversity. If we manipulate and control the fire regime components by prescribed burning to achieve specific conservation goals. And the prescribed burning is a widely applied conservation tool, in, uh, for example, in prairies or conifer forests or heathlands. But in Europe, it's uh, rather rarely applied and very rarely applied in grasslands. So I would like to shortly introduce you uh, or uh, review about the prescribed burning in European grasslands, where we wanted to evaluate the European uh, results of prescribed burning studies in grasslands and compare it to the North American studies. Because in North America, prescribed burning has a very long tradition and it is applied for many conservation uh, problems very successfully. And uh, this table summarizes the studies which uh, are dealing with uh, prescribed burning in Europe. You can see that there are very few studies. I would like to highlight only one uh, important uh, thing that uh, most of these studies were conducted for many, many years and uh, they used yearly burning. So it means that they burned the same plots uh, for 20 or 28 years, uh, which is a uh, uh, which is a logical experimental setup, but it doesn't resemble the uh, natural fire regimes. So that is why most of these studies uh, found that burning is not proper for conserving the European grasslands. But I would like to stress that yes, yearly burning is not proper, but perhaps some sophistication of the burning regime can be a good uh, solution for some nature conservation problem. We established uh, four objectives um, for which uh, prescribed burning might be a good option in European grasslands after careful testing. Uh, the first objective is the re reduction of accumulated biomass because uh, the dormant season fires can effectively remove the uh, litter. And uh, we uh, have to make sure that uh, we do not apply too frequent burning because it might result in untargeted species composition and we should test the proper fire return periods before application. Another uh, important objective could be the supporting of several target species because uh, the literature mentioned uh, several positive effects on uh, certain species, uh, but for uh, this we need uh, more case studies focusing on particular species. Another a good objective could be the management of open landscapes because fire can effectively suppress uh, woody encroachment in open landscapes and the combination of grazing and fire management can be a very good tool for increasing landscape scale, heterogeneity and functional diversity. And finally, the last objective could be the control of invasive and alien species. This is not much studied in Europe, but from North America, we have uh, several positive examples. And uh, uh, we think that it could be very important and interesting to test uh, the uh, use of fire for several uh, invasive species control programs in Europe. So uh, to conclude uh, this talk, I would like to uh, mention that uh, the evaluation of fire effects uh, on the uh, biodiversity largely depends on the ecosystem attributes and on the fire regime. The same fire regime can have different effects on different uh, ecosystems and in the same ecosystem, different fire regimes can have very different effects. So that is why we would need 
prescribed bundling experiments to understand more the effects of fire on the biodiversity. And uh, this way we could develop effective measures for minimizing the negative eff effects of light, fire, and arson. And uh, we could test the effectiveness of a potentially feasible alternative ma management tool, prescribed burning. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very yeah. much. It's a very interesting presentation. We've received a couple of, uh, of questions to your talk. For instance, um, in what way does early fire create optimal nesting opportunities for the great bastard? Asked by Dave van Wees. Uh, this is a very good question. It's not for the nesting, but for the mating. So this species um, has a very uh, interesting mating system. The males display competitive uh, performances for the female and they, if there is a recently burned area the males can be more attractive there they are more conspicuous and the uh, more females gather near the males and also there is more uh, food for uh, both the males and females so this increased the chance of mating and another question by kevin mganga uh, does germination of the plant species after fire uh, is it a result of litter removal or is it breaking the dormancy of seeds or perhaps both? Uh, this is also a very interesting question and I'm sure that uh, both mechanisms operate uh, together, yeah. And then maybe a last one is about why, why, there, why are there so many fires in Europe around Easter? Uh, this is a um, tradition uh, to the ancient pastoral traditions, but nowadays I think it's uh, more like some habit and uh, some, some which, which they are used to it and uh, it does not have a real reason, but uh, in many places in Hungary, Romania, Bulgaria, uh, Slovakia, it's uh, typical that the whole landscape burns around Easter. Okay, thank you. I would like to thank you very much again for your presentation and for, for the answers to the questions, to everyone who was asking questions. And then I would hand over to Kathleen Stoff, who is leading our final discussion round. Thank you. Um, Elizabeth, is there something you would like to add in the meantime? Or you come at the end? No, I have a, just an announcement for the end. So just go ahead. Thanks. All right, cool. Well, thanks a lot to our speakers um, and uh, for everybody attending, by the way, the people you see in the screen are, are first Chloe Hill from, from EGU, who worked around the clock to really, she, she sent emails day and night to, to organize this all. So a big thanks to Chloe. Um, then uh, other than that, the people who you haven't heard speak yet are, are the conveners. So Elizabeth Pizza is our, our main convener. Then we have Alicia Coppola. Um, and uh, Sander Braverbeker, and then uh, Rika who, uh, Laszlo, who just uh, uh, moderated the previous part. Uh, my name is Katalijne Stoof. Um, I work at Wageningen University in the Netherlands, and I'm the creator and the leader of FireLife, which is an innovative training network on integrated fire management. And we're training 15 PhD candidates, and some of you are, are, are on, the, on the call actually right now. Um, the, 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 the goal of this last 15 minutes is, is to have a plenary discussion. And um, uh, basically the, the question I have for the panelists is, is fire is extremely interdisciplinary. And, and I wondered if, 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 what do you think we as scientists can do to better manage the, the global fire crisis, uh, to do better research or to have more impact on policy or setting research agendas? Um, I, I would like to think outside of the box, but maybe you have a message for, for everybody about the, the, the 250, 300 people who are attending right now. Who, we, who would like to, to give their perspective? Christina, I see you smiling. Do you? <laughs> well, do you I'm think? sure, I'm just going to say one thing because I'm sure all the others will have other things to add, but I think we absolutely need more social science. So, and not only more social science, but we need to work more with, like we environmental uh, scientists need to work more with social uh, scientists, especially in Europe where many of us are now and where fires are a problem, not as big in, in, in proportions as in, as in Australia, but they are really important big environmental issue with us. Um, 
and here most of the fire is a human is human cause. So we def definitely need to understand more the social implications of fires. Thank you. Thanks. Orsolia, what is your perspective? What what should we as scientists? What what is your message for 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 everybody attending to to so we can all better prepare for the global fire crisis? Uh, it's a very difficult question and very interesting. Uh, I think that uh, we should uh, separate somehow the different fire regimes because uh, we cannot uh, cannot talk about fire in general, but uh, only about uh, specific fire regimes from uh, the viewpoint of uh, both the people, the society and the ecosystems. So it would be very important to separate these. Uh, and uh, uh, as for me as an ecologist, uh, it would be very important to test more realistic fire regimes because uh, generally we focus on some uh, controllable uh, yearly burning or we, we can uh, have some uh, snapshots about different uh, burning histories but it would be very interesting to know the history of fire regimes and uh, test something like that. Nice. You say it, we need to, to look at more separate fire regimes. That makes me think of, of a comment from Mark Castelnau, who many of you probably know. He's the, he's the fire chief of, of the, uh, the Catalan Fire Service. And he said, fire is the same language everywhere. We just have different dialects and we need to understand those dialects better. I, I really like that. Coming from Northwestern Europe, where, where people say fire is different here, I, I liked his way of, 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 of phrasing that. Um, if, I, and, if I could um, uh, chip in as a uh, genetically a European, but, but very much a um, uh, systemically an Australian. Um, <laughs> Go for it, but, David. But I think that there's a, a misapprehension, certainly in, in Western sort of view that there isn't a fire culture. And what I think Europeans need to do is actually dig into their own past. And the few times I've been to Europe, it's actually surprised me that there, there are still folk traditions or, or very close uh, proximity to those folk traditions of the use of fire. And, and also there are prehistoric traditions. And so, Really, the, the question about human coexistence with fire is how much of it is uh, doing this, you know, from scratch, and how much of it's actually facing up to your own uh, histories and culture and environment. Because the solution to coexisting with fire and the global fire crisis is actually very much exactly the same solution as the pandemic, and that is that the solution is going to be place-based. It's going to be local and global perspectives are very useful, but they're also potentially very dangerous. And we're going to have to, what the pandemic is teaching us is that we have to go back to being where we are and being who we are and not trying to find a global and a generic solution And which one of the impulses in, in the scientific tradition is that there's going to be a global or a universal explanation and that's, Possibly the global and universal explanation is that there isn't one, it's actually local, and that you actually have to dive into your culture and into your environment and actually understand that. And that's why I thought the example from Hungary was so beautiful, because that was actually very close proximity, deep ecological knowledge, which is seen to be in some way, it's got connected to Christianity, uh, Christian tradition, but actually it's far deeper than that. Clearly, it probably goes back well into the whole scene. Um, and and what, when I was in France last year, it was quite clear that there were traditions that probably are stemming from the Pleistocene in Europe, that people haven't understood that, that they see that there's a disjunction or a break and they haven't understood that actually it's part of a continuity and that there's, in a sense, scientifically and also in the European tradition, amnesia that needs to be got over. And uh, I tell you what, coming to Australia, being an Australian and interacting with Aboriginal people is the best cold shower you can have. It wakes you up. And the Aborigines are asserting themselves and saying, you know, we have a tradition, we have a culture, we have a knowledge. You have to work with us. And I think 
that Europeans have got to look into themselves and say, we have a tradition, we have a, a culture and a knowledge. We have to work with ourselves. So a call, a call for going back to their roots, do, digging back into the history to look at the local, at the local expertise that there is or, or was and, and linking with a great compliment you made about uh, the Hungarian story from Ursulia about that. Very, very nice. Um, Gida, what is what is your perspective? What, what what do we scientists need to do to 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 better manage the global fire crisis and have more more impact? <laughs> you want to have more impact? Yeah, I think this this kind always. of <laughs> conference is always a good start, right? Getting, I think the first thing you need is a holistic view. So I mean, look at the five talks over here. You know, we talk about air quality, talk about um, carbon stuff. Uh, fire stuff, but also um, you know, more ecology focus. I mean, it, uh, basically a lot of these things are trade-offs and the choices, right? I mean, we, we talked about the deforestation in the Amazon and that's related to, to for example, uh, beef production. So I guess once you understand all those aspects, I guess the second one, and then I definitely agree with Christina, I mean, getting social sciences involved and trying to relate it to the public. I mean, that, that's a from my perspective, always a huge challenge to um, we spend all our lives trying to get this knowledge and then you want to do something with it. And I, I have figured out what the best way is. So not sure if that's a useful answer, but uh, it's, it's more like something I'm struggling with. Uh, so. does, does anybody on the, on the panel or maybe one of the conveners have a, have a solution for that struggle that, that Guido indicates and that I'm sure many of us have? I'm also, I'm, I'm multitasking, also reading, reading some comments. I see no solutions. Um, then another, another question from the, uh, for, for the panel, for the panelists is, is um, if we do better prepare for that global fire crisis, what is, what is the, when, what, what is in your view, the most important limitation for progress in fire research? Is that the observations that we have, or the or 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 the gaps in our knowledge, or the understanding of the tools? What is what is the biggest challenge? Let's let's frame it in another way. What is the what is the biggest challenge for that for that better integration between the disciplines? Because fire is is spread across all disciplines. We do, and and there was there were ideas to make a fire uh, division at the EGU a few years ago, but. Uh, uh, we, we don't have a fire division yet. So what, what, what can be done to, to better integrate us as, as researchers? Pido. It might start with, uh, I mean, a lot, of, a lot of scientists, right? We do experiments and try, I mean, I think that could be a start. And I think, for example, the ED work group has tried to do that. Like if you have a, an experiment somewhere, uh, People have done this a lot, try to get different disciplines involved. Uh, I mean, for example, the work about biodiversity. I mean, we, we're trying to do early season burning to mitigate carbon, but that may affect biodiversity and it's something we, we never really thought about. So um, getting those big um, experiments going um, with people from different disciplines, that might be an easy start. And you, you, you mentioned the name of a work group. Is it, can, you, can you say more about that? Is that a work group where, where people are brought together that do experiments and then invite other people? Or? Yeah, that, that's coming more from the atmospheric sciences. So that's IBI, I double B I. Uh -huh. And they have one of those goals. But that's, I mean, I think this, I mean, fire is so <laughs> multidisciplinary. I mean, even if I think from an atmospheric point of view, I already think of the fire, you know so many different groups and then you only have the atmospheric point of view so uh, yeah but it takes your 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 point is is valid i think because i, I know how much energy and, and and planning it takes to 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 plan a fire and to conduct a fire so and maybe not everybody is is, is everybody can use uh, experimental or prescribed fires but there's definitely room for for more collaboration that can go into that planning Maybe that is something that the EGU could play a role in as well, or like the networking. So if I, if I could say something, I, I think that there are, um, in terms of the barriers, I think one of the problems, the division between scientists and managers is that 
we haven't encouraged curiosity in managers, that managers are actually doing experiments where, where we're learning by doing. And uh, there's a huge debate here in Australia about prescribed burning, and it's quite strange because it's a, it's, it's a, a debate being acted out with very entrenched views overlaid on rapid climate change. And so even if either side, one side was more right than the other, it's actually a little bit irrelevant because the solution, whatever the solution was or could be, is very much a retrospective thing because it's now being overlaid on all of these other rapid changes which go with the Anthropocene, including a pandemic. And so that, you know, in other words, if you don't have curious managers, if you don't have people who are looking at a system with curiosity and interest, then they're not actually going to be understanding that effectively they're doing experiments, they're learning by doing, and sometimes that has to be rigorously evaluated, but sometimes that can just be used to motivate people to excite community groups. So, well, let's try this. You don't need a boring scientist to make it into a factorial experiment. That would ruin the fun. But sometimes... Well, not always. You need, <laughs> sometimes you do need a boring scientist to say, hang on, if you do that at scale, you could really do serious harm here. So there needs to be um, an understanding and maybe, you know, we're, we're expecting too much um, of ourselves. But then you have to go back to the fact that these folk traditions arose from somewhere and they were reasonably adaptive because if they weren't there wouldn't be any biodiversity so you know there's clearly humans and fire can work together um and, and very effectively you know that australia was so beautifully biodiverse rich uh, a mere 200 years ago before um, a whole bunch of europeans turned up and, and set to work on it in complete ignorance of of all of the complexity of the socio-cultural traditions which were wrapped around managing that environment. So you, you need this curiosity, trial and error, and also all of the, the virtues of science, but a real honesty that there are many vices in science. Science can be divisive, it can be dangerous, it can be self-serving, it can alienate, um, it, can, it can have a lot of very negative factors and that can, that, that can scale through to, to people dictating how savannah fires should be uh, worked in countries that aren't their own. I mean, that, that you have to be, you know, extremely mindful that there are, you know, local and national political cultural differences too. And scientists okay. need to understand that. And I think, I think that's a very good point that you have to be very mindful of, of the local understanding, the, the customs, and, and working with the people. Uh, in the interest of time, I have to wrap up this discussion. So um, basically uh, uh, the needs that you will indicate are, are that we need more social science um, uh, in, and, and we need to work more as environmental scientists, we need to work more with social scientists. We need to look more at separate fire regimes or, or understand those fire dialects. Um, we need to dig into our own past to understand to 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 link what we do now based on uh, to to what we've maybe already done in the past. So we only need to maybe reconnect to that and see how we can use that. And we need to approach fire from a holistic view, um, and 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 then uh, see if we can get more collaboration, for instance, on experiments, not just among scientists but also with managers. Um, and with that, we have a load of unanswered questions in the chat. We will be discussing uh, amongst the conveners and also with Chloe and, and, and with the panel how, uh, how, if it's possible for, for, for panelists to, to see if they can answer them. Uh, either we share them on Twitter or we share them on, uh, on the EGU website. Um, I don't know what is, what is possible. I see Chloe doing like this, so yeah. <laughs> Uh, if if there it, so the 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 recording of this webinar will be published on the EGU website and we will include information there on on, on how we how we treat those those answers and I see Chloe nodding so that's good. With that, I give the word back to uh, Elizabeth. Yes, uh, thank you. Um, uh,
thank you to everybody here and for all the speakers. And maybe I'm sharing the wrong screen again, but anyway, the main messages you probably can see here. So we, um, we will continue the discussion because all the rest of the day is uh, several uh, fire sessions going on. And we will provide also uh, probably some uh, questions, um, answer to questions later on. But please, uh, when you leave the session now, please provide us uh, some of your feedback. There will be a feedback button when you leave the, the, the webinar. And uh, it would be great uh, if you can fill that up. So thanks to all the speakers again. Thanks to all our, my conveners and to Chloe especially, and to all of you for joining. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Uh, bye. <laughs>